Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This video is about this triple integral. Each variable is from 0 to 1. We are integrating the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. If we have a vector with three components, v1, v2, and v3, if these components are random variables, specifically they are independent and identically distributed random variables with uniform distribution over the interval from 0 to 1. And if we are interested in the expected value of the L to norm of this vector, then this is the integral that we need to evaluate. The game plan is to convert the triple integral into a double integral using the spherical coordinates and the divergence theorem. Then we will use polar coordinates to convert the double integral into a single integral, which is solved using substitution. So our first step is to take this triple integral and to write it down in terms of a double integral, making use of the divergence theorem. The divergence theorem states that the integral of the divergence of a vector field over a volume inside a closed surface this integral is equal to the surface integral of the vector field. In order to apply the divergence theorem, we need to express our integrand as a divergence of a vector field. Let's remind ourselves what is the divergence of a vector expressed using the spherical coordinates. So we have a vector A, and it has three components, A sub R, that's in the direction of the R vector of spherical coordinates, and then A sub theta in the direction of theta, and finally A phi in the direction of phi. The divergence of this vector field is given by this formula here. In case a theta and a phi are both zeros, so if this is zero and this is zero, the divergence is just this term, one over r squared, then the partial derivative with respect to r of r squared, and then this component, which is a sub r. We will consider a vector field in which in the r direction, it is equal to r squared, and r is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. According to this formula, the divergence of this field is to take this r squared and multiply it by r squared, this will be r to the power 4. Then we need to differentiate with respect to r. When we do this, we will get 4r cubed. Then we divide by r squared. This gives us 4r. Note that r is our integrand. The trivial integral of interest can be written as one fourth of the integral over the volume of the divergence of this field. By the divergence theorem, we can convert this volume integral into a surface integral. Thus, epsi, which is our trivial integral of interest, is one fourth an integral over the surface of the unit cube, which is here in the non negative orthant. The cube has six faces. If this is x, this is y, this is z, there is a face in the xy plane, another in the xz plane, and another in the zy plane. Let's focus on the face in the xy plane. There is a point, say, here, and this is the position vector of the point, and it is equal to r, r hat, the unit vector. Now, this vector is orthogonal to the vector that is normal to this face here. The vector that is normal to this face, pointing outside the enclosed volume, is in the minus z direction. And for all the points that are here, this r vector and the vector minus z are orthogonal to one another. This tells us that when we do the integration on these faces, we get zero. Then we have another three faces. This is one of them. And the integral on each one of those faces, again, due to the symmetry of the integrand, will be the same. So let's focus on this face and rewrite epsi as three-fourths of the integral on that face. In the surface integral, we have r squared. So r squared is z squared plus x squared plus y squared. And on this face, z is fixed at 1. This is 1 plus x squared plus y squared. This is this term here. Then we have r dot ds. ds will be dx dy. And then a vector that is normal to this face here, pointing outside the enclosed volume. This is vector z hat. We know that r hat vector, its component in the direction of z hat is cosine theta. This dot product here is cosine theta dx dy. And what is cosine theta? Cosine theta is the z coordinate of any point that is here. All those points have a z coordinate that is equal to 1. Divided by r, the distance between the point and the origin. This will be x squared plus y squared and 1 squared. What we have now is this times this dx dy. This is specifically r squared r hat dot ds evaluated on this top face of the unit cube. We have now finished our first step of converting the triple integral into a double integral. To proceed further, we now try to reduce this double integral into a single integral by using the polar coordinates dx dy can be written as rho d rho d phi. Rho is the square root of x squared plus y squared, and phi is the tan inverse of y over x. x is rho cosine phi, and y is rho sine phi. 
we want to integrate this over this square here in the xy plane. Using polar coordinates, this becomes the square root of 1 plus rho squared. The integral is exactly the same if we integrate over this half square or that half square. So we can multiply this 3 fourth by 2, and we can focus on the integral over this triangle here. Over this triangle, if we fix phi, phi will be between 0 and pi over 4. If we fix phi, what is the range of rho, which gives the distance to the origin? Rho will go from 0 to this length here. If this is phi and this is 1, then the maximum value of rho is 1 over cosine phi or sec phi. Our integral here can be written as double integral, where phi goes from 0 to pi over 4, rho goes from 0 to 1 over cosine phi, and then we have the square root of 1 plus rho squared, rho d rho d phi. We can integrate easily with respect to rho. The integral with respect to rho is 1 third 1 plus rho squared to the power 3 over 2. If we differentiate this quantity here, we get 3 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 plus rho squared to the power 1 half. And then by the chain rule, we get also 2 rho. 2 goes with 2, 3 goes with 3, and we end up with rho times the square root of 1 plus rho squared. We then use the lower and upper limits of integration, and this is what we have. Our double integral now is reduced into 1 half times this single integral with respect to phi from 0 to pi over 4. When we put rho equal to 0, we get minus 1, and this integration will just give us minus pi over 4 times 1 half, that's minus pi over 8. The challenge now is to integrate 1 plus sec squared phi or to the power 3 over 2. To carry out this integration, we use the following substitution. We use 1 plus sec squared phi, which is this quantity here, equal to 2 cosine squared t. This means that sec phi is equal to the square root of 2 cosine squared t minus 1. Because sec squared phi is equal to 1 plus 10 squared phi, then 10 phi is equal to the square root of 2 cosine squared t minus 2. For d phi, we have 2 sec phi, and the derivative of sec phi is sec 10, so this sec becomes sec squared phi, 10 phi, d phi, this is equal to 2, and then another 2 cosine t, that's 4 cosine t, and the derivative of cosine is shine t, dt. d phi is equal to 4 cosine t, shine t, dt, and then we divide by 10 phi, which is given here, and we divide by 2 sec squared phi, and sec squared phi is 2 cosine squared t minus 1. We can rewrite everything using t, including the limits of integration. Let's see, if phi is equal to 0, then sec phi is equal to 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, so cosine squared t is equal to 1, t is equal to 0. If phi is equal to pi over 4, sec pi over 4 is square root 2, square root 2 squared, that's 2 plus 1, that's 3, so cosine t is the square root of 3 divided by 2. In other words, our integral will be from 0 to cosine inverse, the square root of 3 over 2. Let's call this quantity alpha. Our integral here is from 0 to alpha, and then 1 plus sec squared phi, this is 2 cosine squared t. If we raise this to the power 3 over 2, we get 2 square root 2 cosine squared becomes cosine cubed. We have here cosine cubed t. d phi is written here in terms of dt. Note that under this square root, we have 2 cosine squared t minus 2. We can take square root 2 as a common factor. Cosine squared t minus 1 is shine squared t. When we take the square root, we end up with shine t. And for this part here, 2 cosine squared t minus 1 is cosine 2t. 2 square root 2 goes with 2 square root 2. This 4 with this 1 half becomes 2. We have an integral from 0 to alpha cosine to the power 4t divided by cosine 2t, and these two guys go away. The cosine to the power 4 in the numerator, write it as cosine squared times cosine squared. Then this can be written as 1 plus shine squared. Cosine t to the power 4 is cosine t squared plus cosine squared shine squared. Recall that shine 2t is equal to 2 shine t cosine t. Cosine squared t shine squared t can be written as 1 fourth shine 2t squared. Shine squared t can be written as 1 half plus 1 half cosine 2t. What we are trying to do is to write everything shine or cosine with an argument that is 2t. This cosine t to the power 4 can be written as 1 half plus 1 half cosine 2t plus 1 fourth shine squared 2t. Everything now is written in terms of 2t. This is the integral that we currently have. Integral dt of 1 from 0 to alpha, that's alpha. So let's shift our focus to this guy here. 
Suppose that u is equal to 2t. This integral can be written as one half integral from zero to two alpha of such u du. This is one over cosine u. Multiply the numerator and denominator by cosine u. So we get cosine u in the numerator and cosine u squared in the denominator. Rewrite cosine squared u as one plus sine squared u. So this is the integral d sine u over one plus sine squared u. This integral can be written in terms of the inverse tangent function. What we have is arctan of sine u, and then we use our lower and upper limits of integration. Shine zero is zero, and then inverse zero is zero. We end up with one half arc and shine two alpha. This is when we take this guy here. We just have one more step, which is to integrate shine two t squared divided by cosine two t. We start like here. We use u equal to two t, then we get one half, and now we are integrating from zero to two alpha. Shine u squared divided by cosine u. Multiply the numerator and denominator by cosine u. We have cosine u, and then shine squared u. In the denominator, we have cosine squared u. This is shine squared u plus one minus one times cosine u divided by cosine squared u, which is shine u squared plus one. And cosine u du is d shine u. Here we get one minus one over shine u squared plus one. When we integrate this guy, we get shine u. When we use our limits of integration, we get shine two alpha multiplied by this external one half. Then we have an integral one over shine u squared plus one, which looks like what we have here. And we get again a result in terms of the inverse tangent function. We put everything together, and this is our triple integral. Minus pi over 8, then alpha, plus 1 over 4, shine 2 alpha, and then we have 1 fourth, 10 inverse, shine 2 alpha, where alpha is cosine inverse square root 3 over 2. We are basically done. We can sort of refine the form of the final result by investigating what shine 2 alpha is. Shine 2 alpha is 2 shine alpha cosine alpha. Now alpha itself is cosine inverse square root 3 over 2. Cosine alpha is square root 3 divided by square root 2 times 2. So this is square root 6. We need shine of cosine inverse square root 3 over 2. One way of doing this is to use the expression of cosine inverse in terms of the natural logarithm. Cosine inverse z is len z plus square root z squared minus 1. When we use z equal to the square root of 3 over 2, this becomes the natural logarithm of the square root 3 over 2 plus 1 over square root 2. Now we want to find the shine. So the shine of this quantity here is e to the power of this quantity. This gives us square root 3 over 2 plus 1 over square root 2 minus. We have e to the power minus this quantity, which is 1 over this. We can show that the reciprocal is square root 3 over 2 minus 1 over square root 2. We can check that this is the reciprocal of that. Just to multiply these two guys together, we get 3 over 2 minus 1 half, which is 1. And then in the definition of the shine, we take this difference and divide by 2. When we compute the difference in the numerator, we get 2 divided by the square root of 2, but then we have 2 here in the denominator, so the result is 1 over square root 2. To obtain shine of 2 alpha, we need to multiply this by square root 6, that's square root 3. Rather than having this term in terms of alpha, we can actually write it as square root 3 divided by 4. 10 inverse square root 3 is the angle 60 degrees, that's by over 3. By over 3 divided by 4, that's by over 12. We can take this by over 12 and minus by over 8, Together, they give us minus pi over 24. And then there is alpha, which is cosine inverse, the square root of 3 over 2. Some references represent the final result in terms of tangent inverse. Tangent inverse z is 1 over 2, the natural logarithm of 1 plus z over 1 minus z. If we use tangent, then we need to put here 1 over square root 3. This is our result. If we compute this quantity, it is approximately 0.960592. Now let's work an approximate result. At the beginning of the video, I said that the problem can be considered that we have a vector in three dimensions, but now take that we have a vector in n dimensions, and those components are i, i, d, uniform from zero to one. The problem is to find the expected value of the L2 norm of this vector. Our problem is the special case in which small n is equal to three. What is an approximate result for a general n? If we take one over n times the L2 norm squared of vector v, this is 1 over n summation k from 1 to n vk squared. By the strong law of large numbers, this quantity converges almost surely to the second moment of any of those components. The second moment of a random variable that is uniform over the interval from 0 to 1 is 1 third. So this is equal to 1 over 3. Using the continuous mapping theorem, the square root of this quantity, 1 over the square root of n, the L2 norm of vector v converges almost surely to 1 over square root 3. The left hand side, 
is our bounded by one over square root n, the square root of one square plus one squared n times. This is a square root n over square root n, that's one. It means that as a function of n, each one of those random variables is upper bounded by one. The expectation of one is one, which is a finite number. You can apply the dominated convergence theorem and say that this statement about almost sure convergence implies that one over square root n, the expected value of the L2 norm of vector v converges to one over square root three. Of course, this is when n tends to infinity. This statement here tells us that for large enough n, we have that the expected value of the L2 norm is about the square root of n divided by three. Three is not very large, but if we apply this formula here, then we get one. The square root of three over three is one. And this is very close to our exact result. It turns out that this square root n over three is not a bad approximation for our integral of interest. And when we increase the number of variables above three, 